Michael, I believe you are next. <clears throat> I guess I'm on. Okay, hi, good morning everyone. So, hi, and uh, this is the day for you to express yourself before the whole group and God as well. So, you know, if you have anything at all in your heart that you want to say, the bookstore is the place to say it right out in front. <laughs> I've got a pitch pipe in one hand and a script in the other hand. Um, I'm now going to talk about how to become intuitive. Oh my God. Okay. I think there's a lot of presumption in, in this uh, little title. It seems that the solar angel over the years, over the many ages, knows how to bring about that higher polarization of the human being step by step, which automatically eventually leads to the intuitive faculty and to a repolarization on the uh, plane of intuition. You know, once we start to get those love petals of the heroic lotus open and and once the, um, the initiations begin to occur and the synthesis petals open and the and the Quran is built, it will all happen naturally. But of course, we're in a forcing process at the moment. Uh, we do like to force the issue. DK tells us that we can and should, so why not try? Um, there are certain rays and signs which um, are naturally intuitive. Once a certain point of evolution is reached, you know, if you have a good Jupiterian sign or the Sag or Pisces or Gemini, strongly Mercury, the intuition may come in, so maybe we should just wait till we're born with one of those signs and, you know, just forget it. On the other hand, <laughs> we are uh, reaching a point um, of that sort of cleaner uh, interface uh, when the Buddhic principle is about to approach uh, humanity far more closely with the return of the coming one, the Christ, the Lord, Maitreya, the imminent first initiation of humanity, of a portion of humanity, which is uh, significant uh, to leaven the mass of humanity. And, and so with this coming of the Buddhic principle, which we can expect, I think, uh, more strongly in the next hundred years, and especially when uh, the fourth ray is so very uh, strongly coming in in its monadic aspect, the intuition is going to be uh, the cutting edge for so many of us. We might as well learn, you know, how to approach it. Of course, many of us think we may be intuitive when we may simply be psychic, and DK does draw a big distinction between that. Well, we can begin with that one of those definitions of the intuition which has been floating around for a while over the last few days and deserves to be reckoned with. And it's from Glamour, a world problem. And I won't read the whole thing, it's just a little bit. And then you see how high it goes, as Lawson was saying. It's such a, it's, it's such a... ...which is where our spiritual development is really occurring. It can be considered intuition, you know, from the Buddhic, Atmic, Monadic, and Magoic planes. All of that can be considered intuition, but more specifically, uh, immediately for us at this time, what comes from the Buddhic plane. Intuition is a comprehensive grip, a grip of the principle of universality. A comprehensive grip of the principle of universality, and when it is functioning, there is momentarily, at least, a complete loss of the sense of separateness. That's the great heresy. He tells us the heresy of separateness is the great heresy, and intuition dissipates that. At its highest point, it is known as that universal love, which has no relation to sentiment or to the affectional reaction, but is predominantly in the nature of an identification with all beings. That's an amazing sentence. Uh, in the uh, age of Aquarius, uh, Aquarius is the sign of universality, and we can expect when Venus finally comes in after another 1,460 plus 100, 1,560 years, then we will have that uh, age of universal love and of brotherhood. Uh, then is true compassion known, then does criticism become impossible, and then only is the divine germ, the monad, seen as latent in all forms. So that's uh, a very pithy definition of intuition from, from DK's uh, Glamour World Problem, right around page 4. The factors, three factors involved in the intuition are light, understanding, and illumination. And he goes into a wonderful description of that. So what are the ways that we can access and promote this energy? And I have um, a few ideas about how we can promote the um, development of the intuition in our individual and group nature. The first will be an attitude of trust. That which we already seek is within us, and doubt, as Master Moria tells us when he draws the picture of the same praying but the little black serpent is at its heel, you know, doubt can be a poison. It's a poison when you try to 
uh, access your first impressions. First impressions are very important. Meditation 5 in Discipleship in the Middle Age, Volume 2, is all about getting that first intuitive impression. So later, uh, after deception, there is time for discriminative analysis, but doubt will block those first impressions. And even if a lot of stuff comes in, you can sort through it later, let the stuff come in. Okay, trust, that's the first. Second uh, a method uh, to, to employ the open heart. Uh, through concentration upon the heart center uh, between the shoulder blades of the lower part, uh, the heart center, DK tells us, is the organ of Vidu, just the way the head center is the organ of Atma, and uh, I infer that the center at the top of the head, which is the most magnificent 12 petal lotus, which reflects the egoic lotus and probably the monad too, that, I figure, is the organ of the monad. So the heart is the organ of Vidu, and the heart in the head center the organ of the monad, from which even higher intuition can be ex accessed. Let us learn how to when we're, when we're attempting to be intuitive or to tune in, let us learn to keep the heart active, and if we can, the heart and the head. So when we apply the intuition, we can never ignore that particular alignment. Otherwise, uh, much that will be invoked may simply come from the solar plexus or from any circular thoughts within the mind. You know, uh, there are many first thoughts which have to be rejected by a point of tension, which acts as a deflecting wall. So that's a special technique. If your intensity is sufficiently intense, you will deflect the ordinary. That's really important. OK, uh, with the heart center and the heart and the head at least imaginatively activated, because energy does follow thought, and you want to be able to activate these chakras within yourself by concentrating upon them, uh, it will be possible to begin grasping holes, W-H-O-L-E-S, wholeness. So, um, and, and, and intuition, as we have just read, is all about wholeness and the apprehension of wholeness and the apprehension of non-separateness. So then the sun, let us say, it rules the heart center uh, ex exoterically, but in a way certainly esoterically in a deeper way. The sun rules the heart center, we learn in esoteric astrology. And the sun embraces the entire solar system, so it's certainly an inclusive holistic organ. The great planet Jupiter is found esoterically within the heart center, second in scope only to the sun, virtually a star in itself. So Jupiter is the great planet of whole making. See, the visualization of planets, stars, and certainly plan uh, certain planetary gifts on the correct note can be a method of induction of the flow of the intuition. From a higher perspective, Neptune rules the heart center. We oftentimes stick it in the solar plexus, but that's just its lower aspect. It's a secondary monad, and in the hearts of great people and initiates and masters, Neptune is strongly involved with the heart and the heart and the head. Um, with this monad aspect. Uranus is a planet of timelessness, wholeness, and simultaneous apprehension. Uranus is not a planet of sequentiality. That's Saturn. This, 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 this. Uranus is everything all at once, and we know how often the intuition comes to us suddenly as a, uh, a, a bolt that simply includes and can be broken out into many different sequential factors. So let us use these centers, especially the heart center and the heart within the head, and to a certain extent the head center as a whole, uh, under these particular planets that I've mentioned, and I, I didn't mention Mercury, of course, and all of that. The visualization of the planets is very important. You begin to come on rapport with the Vedic streams that are connected with these planets. You begin to attune with them with, to, uh, through color and sound, and on the threads of these planetary streams come many fine ideas and new energies. Mercury will always transmit from one place to another, and we want to be the receiver. Okay. I would uh, also work magically, in this particular case, as part of the new invocative magical astrology, to place the appropriate glyphs of certain planets within the appropriate center, and accompanied by the color of the glyph. So I think we all know what, let us say, um, uh, well, we know what the sun looks like, the circle with the dot, we know what Jupiter looks like, the big number four, interestingly enough, it's got a lot to do with the number four. We know what Neptune looks like, okay? So we're going to play a little game here. We're going to, you know, uh, in HPB's uh, esoteric writings, I don't know exactly when it was produced, but obviously before she died. And, um, <laughs> well, or maybe not so obviously. <laughs> 
she has all of these things broken down in colors. They're marvelous. And she shows us the whole uh, uh, the diatonic scale and uh, note by note what they stand for. And then we have to add, of course, Mars, Neptune, and Pluto, which we, uh, and other things. So notice the note Mi, M-I, according to the Vasky system, represents the note uh, Mercury. It's the... Um, it's the note E, if we start with the um, note C as Do. That's the note E for me. So if I do, 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 I, you know, eyesight would help. All right. All right. All right. We're going to sound the me, which is the Mercury note. And we're going to associate this not only with a major third of the personality, which is attuned to the soul, but we're going to associate it with the Buddha plane, whose color is yellow as far as humanity is concerned. Although violet for the sun and blue for the planetary logos. But it's a yellow color. And let us just sound this note while we visualize the yellow glyph of Mercury in our midst, attuning to the Buddha plane. There's a yellow mercury before you. It's that I must very me. And the sound of no one of me. We'll return to the higher part of the personality and the bitter plane. Here we go. Oh. colored ideas can come in on that stream of yellow, which is not only mental, but is related to the color of harmony. So you have to learn how to use color and sound in the appropriate way. We don't necessarily have the, the point from which to stand. You know, one of the great Greek mathematicians said, give me a point on which to stand and I can move the world. Was it Archimedes? Someone like that. You know, he just needed a good fulcrum. And, you know, but here I am. We don't have that yet. We don't know it is the true A or true C. We don't know the truth of the matter because there are many spans and many different colors in these things. But one day we will have one true note, and from one true note we can derive many others. Okay, let us sound the note soul. Sounds a lot like soul, doesn't it? Do, re, mi, fa, soul. That's a G, okay. And that is the note of the second ray. Except if you start an A, then it's note of the seventh ray, but now we'll call it the second ray note. Okay. And we'll start a sound a soul, and we'll visualize a big Jupiter in royal blue in our midst, as if we can call down the Jupiter, Jupiterian stream of energy. But, um, so we will sing an om on the soul note, S-O-L, which is the sun and Jupiter as well. Mm. I want to call in the daughters that are on that stream, and I want to call in the Jupiterian stream. I visualize the color blue, the glyph in the color blue, and I open my heart, and I open the heart and the head, and I bring it in. Okay, we can also sound the note La. Uh, now, La is very interesting because it, 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 La is normally an A, but I have a feeling, and I, you know, I can't say this for sure, but Neptune and, and Venus are very close together. You know, Neptune is the higher octave of Venus. So I sometimes like to think of Neptune as La flat, which is really A flat if we begin on C. So let's see. Uh, we will sing a lecture note uh, concentrating on, in the heart and the head center. And we can visualize the color rose as we do this. Or if you've ever seen Neptune, a very, very deep blue. Have you seen the planet, how it's been photographed? Incredibly deep blue. So that's its second ray All right. So here we are, finding a flat. Here's a nice rosy Neptune in our midst. The heart of the head center is open. We are going cosmic now. Oh. See, these are, these are planets connected with the heart and the heart and the head apparatus and the colors that can be connected. And we need to experiment with this to see what kind of flows we can induce in ourselves. Whenever I personally think of the color rose, something immediately happens to me. I don't like pink, but when I think about rose, you know, I feel it immediately. I mean, you think I have the sixth ray. Okay, here we go. These are just a few possible associations. Okay. 
So uh, this can trigger intuitive alignment. Now, also, some people work with uh, mantras, with uh, uh, pendulums, with uh, talismans. Those little things um, mean something personal, personally to you. Uh, it is said that our, our Alfred Lord Tennyson he used to repeat his name, just his name, and he would immediately go into a soul state. It was his particular trigger. If you have some kind of trigger, if it's a, you know, your intuition is always working somehow, and if it's the pendulum, if it's some other apparatus, whatever it is, it's personal to you. Master Moria said, don't criticize the yogi sitting on the water just because he's holding a feather. For him, the feather meant something, and it made it possible for him to levitate on the water. So if, if something works for you, that's good. Okay. I would also say, when did you press that thing? <laughs> it's not six minutes, you know. All right. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm fine. You know, this is not a long talk. Not a talk at all, really. Uh, I, would, I would also suggest what I would call the initial suspension of the factor of analysis. You know, I'm one of those people that always attacks things with analysis, but I don't want to do that at first. I want to suspend my analysis at first. It's really good to apply analysis to that which has been received, but not so good to apply it to the factor of reception. It works against the reception of holes. You want to receive the whole thing first, then you can get as analytical as you like, but get out of your own way first. So the suspension of the factor of analysis will help to induce the intuition. Another approach is to open the imagination directly to soul impression, or even to higher, more purely intuitive impression. Now, in other words, I don't know this. Something in me knows it. What do I say? Okay, show me something. You know, show me something. So I know there's that factor that in me that knows, and if I have sufficient trust and in the mind and the heart, uh, I can simply ask a question of the inner knowing. And, and, and then wait for the symbol. I say, sometimes I say, show me a picture, show me a scene, show me something. And it's amazing what the imagination will constellate when you are connected with the higher parts of yourself. Uh, you know, don't concentrate on your solar plexus or sacral center and say, show me something, because it will. This is the, the, the higher alignment is what is needed, and then the picture will show you something that represents that higher aspect. I would also suggest this when, when thinking about the intuition. It's a way for thing. I'm remembering how Master R, or rather, when he, he called him Francis Bacon at that time, described his own mind, which he said had a capacity to see both similarities and differences in equal measure. Okay, but I would suggest trying to look first for things in common rather than disparities. So look for the links. Look for things that are related to each other and not for the differences. And later you can attack the differences. Use ray 4 first and ray 5 later. Okay, uh, so yes, I said that. Okay. Okay, uh, yes. And then attempt to perceive things uh, as other piece rather than in pieces. As other piece rather than in pieces. What we're looking for is the is the factor of analysis within the seed of, within the field of synthesis. So we're looking first for the synthesis, and then we can analyze within that field of synthesis as long as we never break the synthesis. Because if you take everything apart in little pieces, you'll never get the wholeness of it. So hold the whole while taking things apart, but get the whole first. Okay. Now take time, take time. Michael, take time. Take time when encountering new contents of consciousness, because everything perceivable is a content of consciousness. So we can advise us, in this case, study your client for five hours if you're going to work on esoteric healing. Five hours before you do a thing. Horoscope, attunement, meditation, whatever. Number five sounds significant, doesn't it? Probably relates to the solar angel and so forth. Study your client for five hours before you even approach. So do take time when you want to go deeply into something so that impressions of the true nature will seep in. You know, intuition is not always that amazing, sudden, thunderous revelation that comes in an instant. Sometimes it's the seeping quality which we need, and we have to be patient. Patience is very important. Okay. I'm, I'm almost finished here. Okay. Um, Use the planet Venus, which is not necessarily one of the intuitive planets, except as Venus itself, in its own development, is working on the Buddhic level and has high Buddhic achievement connected with it. So use the planet Venus in the color I like to think of its esoteric color, which is indigo, connected with the esoteric color of the fifth ray. You can do rose, you can do uh, uh, orange, but I like to think of that indigo Venus producing the field of unity. 
Uh, and very interesting. This is really interesting. Venus is the fifth ray note because the sine ray of Venus is the fifth ray, and there is a la. La is an A. That's Venus's note, and la is the fifth ray note on which orchestras tune. So I sound an A, and the whole orchestra tunes up with it and achieves unity through that. So we come into attunement with Venus. We don't know what the true A is. As Harold often says, in box time it used to be 416, now it's 440 in Japan, it was at 447. We don't have the true A. But once we have the true A, use it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's what the fourth ray age is for. I mean, you know, it's a seventh ray age, yes, but there's a huge subtone of the fourth ray coming in, as I said, 40,000 years of it. Very, very strong and coming in on a monadic aspect. Another method, of course, to stimulate the intuition, obviously build the antikarana, activate it, and target your first thoughts with such a point of tension that your first thoughts necessarily come from a higher level and not from the realm of the ordinary. Deflect to the ordinary. Those are called cliches. Okay. Another approach, and this is probably the deepest approach of all, Reject all identifications except identification with and as the spirit. Now, that's a huge discipline. In other words, it means not this, not this, not that, not this, not that. In other words, what you say is all contents of consciousness are not it. Of course, they are it also. But they're not it for the time being. And you separate yourself from the illusion by rejecting all factors which are not of the essence. So it's a first grade method of getting things out of the way so the absolute essence can speak. But of course, this is difficult to sustain and it takes many lives to work upon it. In general, I would say this in closing. Uh, immerse ourselves, immerse yourself in the field of love, for love reveals. You know, the, the love has eyes, they say. Love reveals. And uh, Mercury and Jupiter are both planets of intuition. They are both planets of vision. Uh, in the field of love, with the heart open, with the heart in the head, uh, whatever it means to us, as attuned as it can be with the Buddhic and higher levels, we are preparing ourselves for the reception of that which is always going on within us, but which is usually deflected because we are just too preoccupied with lower things. Get those things out of the way, remain in attunement, always keep your heart open when seeking the truth, and it will come. Good morning.